Today on Pilot's Discretion, we're joined by author and pilot John Lancaster. He tells us about a mostly forgotten cross-country air race in 1919, flying the same route in his LSA, and life as a foreign correspondent. Pilot's Discretion starts right now. Welcome, Pilots. I'm your host, John Zimmerman of Sporties, and thanks for listening. If you like Pilots Discretion, there are three things to know. First, you can catch up on every previous episode by visiting sporties.com slash podcast. Second, you can subscribe and leave a review in your favorite podcast app to help other pilots find the show. And third, you can always send your comments to podcast at sporties.com. Today, our guest is John Lancaster, a journalist who has written for the Washington Post and National Geographic, among many other outlets. And he has just released a wonderful new book called The Great Air Race, Glory, Tragedy, and the Dawn of American Aviation. This tells the story of some pioneering pilots who charted a course across America in 1919, and it's a route he flew himself in a flight design CTLS while researching the book. John, welcome to Pilot's Discretion. Well, thank you for having me, John. Like many listeners of this podcast, I'm a big fan of aviation history, so I was surprised reading the book that I'd never heard of this event. Can you tell us briefly what the air race was all about? Yeah, I'd I'd be happy to. I mean, and I should say you're not the only one who's never heard of it. I'd never heard of it either when I first ran across a reference to it. And, uh, uh, you know, when I was pitching the book with an agent to a New York publisher a few years ago, first question out of his, out of the editor's mouth was how come I've never heard of this? So it's, uh, it's, it's not something that's well known in the present day, although it was a huge deal at the time. Um, and for good reason, it was a spectacular, uh, event. This was a, uh, coast to coast transcontinental air race, uh, started two groups of pilots, 63 total, uh, one group, the largest group starting in Long Island at Roosevelt Field, which was an Army Air Service base. We're talking about, you know, the immediate aftermath of World War I here. Uh, and this smaller group of 15 uh, pilots took off from the Presidio in San Francisco, which was also an Army uh, installation. And uh, the idea was is that they would uh, race uh, from coast to coast. And once they reached the opposite coast, uh, they would turn around and go back the other direction. It was a round trip. Uh, uh, race uh, of about 5,400 miles. Uh, and they were flying surplus World War One airplanes, which of course weren't suited to this sort of thing. They'd never been designed for it. Um, uh, and it was basically a publicity stunt. It was an effort by uh, uh, Brigadier General Billy Mitchell, considered the father of the U.S. Air Force, and at the time, a decorated war hero who uh, oversaw U.S. air combat operations on the Western Front. Uh, he uh, conceived this race basically to build congressional and public support for aviation in the aftermath of the war. He understood that it was a game-changing technology. He wanted people to pay attention, and he did get their attention, although not always in the way that he perhaps would have liked. Yeah, you uh, you, you hint at it there, but it's staggering statistics. Nine people died during this race. 54 airplanes crashed, by my math. So did it work? I mean, given those numbers, the race was completed, but would you say it was successful? Did it prove aviation... Was the future could be reliable, or did it give aviation a black eye? Well, it's a it's a complicated, nuanced answer. There's not a simple answer to that question. Um, I would say, in terms of Mitchell's political objectives, which was his immediate concern, uh, you know, he he had staged the race, as I said, to build support for aviation, which in practical terms meant budgetary support from the federal government, uh, and all because they were, the country was demobilizing and there was, wasn't much appetite for spending money on, on new airplanes. And Mitchell knew they needed money to keep the uh, industry afloat. Uh, there was no commercial market at that, at that time. Um, and then as, as another objective, um, a main objective of his was, uh, he wanted uh, Congress to, uh, create, approve an independent air force, uh, probably with him running it, but he didn't say it so openly. Um, but, uh, you know, that was his crusade that really defined his post-war career. Uh, and so, uh, and in that sense, he, he really failed on both counts. I mean, the, the air service continued to demobilize after the race, uh, and he never achieved in his lifetime an independent air force. Uh, he died in 1936. It wasn't until 1947, uh, that the air force was created. And interestingly, the first chief of staff was, a uh, General uh, uh, Carl Tui Spatz, uh, who was a contestant in the uh, in the 1919 air race, he flew he flew uh, uh, he flew in the contest. Um, but so that was on the sort of failure side of the ledger. Uh, but there, I think, in some sense, it you can say it was a success 
it, it, it certainly didn't demonstrate the reliability of airplanes. I mean, as you said, there were 54 crashes, nine fatalities. Two of those fatalities, incidentally, just if I can digress for a second, occurred even before the race started. It was two pilots flying to the start of the race in Long Island. So pretty high mortality rate when you consider there were just 63 aircraft involved in this thing. Um, and uh, anyway, uh, so there was a lot of editorial criticism of the race. You know, it was, this came after a, a conflict that had claimed more than 100,000 young American lives. A lot of editorial writers were, uh, you know, questioned openly, you know, why, what was the point of, uh, of, of uh, you know, sacrificing these young men uh, to a sort of dubious cause in peacetime uh, when the country had already endured so much sacrifice. So that was, th th that was again, you know, uh, uh, something that obviously Mitchell <laughs> was not seeking in orchestrating this race. But in terms of getting the public's attention, in terms of generating uh, broad enthusiasm for uh, for aviation, I think you can say it, it 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 absolutely succeeded. I mean, the country was riveted by by this. Bear in mind that at that point in American aviation history, uh, that you know, airplanes had begun to prove their va battle their their worth on the battlefield in Europe, but there was really no very few civilian applications. The only people who bought airplanes in 1919 were rich guys, you know, with with too much time and money on their hands, uh, and uh, you know the the veteran uh, veterans who bought surplus Curtis Jennies for 300 bucks and barnstormed around the country giving rides and doing loops at county fairs. But there was no there was no commercial air service at all, uh, and all this was highly speculative, and people were quite skeptical of the airplane. Uh, and then all of a sudden, you had this 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 uh, great spectacle of dozens of airplanes flying across the country, landing at these improvised airfields, but, and and and, uh, and making it to the coasts in many cases. Um, and they were riveted. The public was riveted. The, the New York Times carried 30 stories on this contest in the, in the course of a few weeks. Eight of them were on the front page, and that's just one newspaper. I mean, it was really, you can say, it was certainly one of the two or three dominant stories uh, of, of the period. The World Series was also going on when it started. That was another one, but uh, but it was a it was a big deal. Um, and after the contest, there were a lot of naysayers, but there were also perhaps an equal or even greater number of people who said this really does sort of suggest the practical possibilities of air travel. And there were you know editorials written to that effect. In spite of the losses, it's it did did not take a great leap of imagination to see that where this was going, that, you know, they would solve these technical problems, that airfields would be improved, that instruments would be improved, uh, that radios would soon be w widely adopted. It just, the, the, the air, the, the transcontinental air race sort of made it clear what was coming for all its flaws. Give us a sense of just how ambitious or, or even possibly foolish this idea was. You mentioned 5,400 miles. This is at a time when airplanes barely flew, what, 150 miles? Uh, I mean, what would be a modern equivalent of this type of race? It just, it seems staggering. Uh, this was obviously before Lindbergh. This is before even airmail, uh, before, you know, trimotors, ferrying passengers. I mean, how, how ambitious was this idea? Well, as you say, given the technology of the time, it was wildly ambitious and even borderline foolish, as you suggested. Um, and I think, you know, given the death toll, you, you, there's a plausible argument you made that it was foolish. But, but uh, you know, these were planes. This was a motley collection of World War I airplanes. They just, the, the air service just scratched together whatever it had. There were some single seat, seat scouts. Uh, the, most of the planes were de Havilland uh, or DH-4s, uh, actually made by an American company based on a British design. It was the only American combat aircraft that saw service on the Western Front during the war because the United States was sort of late to the party in that regard. And so a lot of the best designs, mo all the best designs really were, were British, French, or Italian. Uh, and uh, uh, so, it, it, you know, there were single seat scouts like uh, SE-5s. And uh, the, the, there was also a handful of captured German Fokker D7s, which was widely considered the most capable fighter of the war. But the point is, these were war planes. They were not built to go long distances. They, they were built, you know, to fly on the Western Front. Uh, and so the, the DH-4 had a range of maybe three hours um, and uh, the others, uh, the, the Fokker, somewhat less. Um, and, uh, so as, as a consequence, they had to design the route in a way to accommodate the limitations of these airplanes. So they had refueling stops that they called control stops every, tw uh, excuse me, about, you know, roughly every 200 miles, there were about 20 of them. I mean, it varied anywhere from between say 60 miles and 250 miles. Uh, and, and in the latter case, that would be sort of at the outer limits of their range. And, um, 
so that's one thing. They just the, the technology was just not really quite ready for prime time. Uh, and then, of course, uh, they had no radios. Um, it, radios had been introduced towards the end of the war uh, and were starting to be used on the Western Front, but they were not used at all in this race. The planes were not equipped with radios. So there was no communication with the ground. They couldn't get word if, if you know, the weather had closed in at, at a destination airfield, for example. Uh, and um, uh, the, you know, and, and instrumentation was certainly not suited to flying in bad weather. They basically had an altimeter and an airspeed indicator, maybe what's called a bubble indicator, which was sort of like a carpenter's level that would serve as a bank indicator of sorts. But if they flew into bad weather, which of course they did all the time and which accounted for a number of fatalities, uh, they relied on the old seat of the pants techniques, you know, basically the pressure of the, of, of the seat on their posteriors and and that's how they could tell whether they were slipping or skidding or and uh obviously that has its limitations in uh, in in low visibility conditions uh and uh and then there was just the, the the infrastructure itself you asked about how ambitious this was well they basically had to create an entire transcontinental airway out of nothing there were by my count let's see maybe well there was of course the the field at roosevelt field in long island was well established there was one at the presidio there were a couple uh, sort of airfields along the way. There was a U.S. air, airmail had just gotten started, and there was an airmail field in Bryan, Ohio. Um, but for the most part, they just winged it. They, they literally, like with a week or so before the, the race, and in some cases just a few days before the race, you know, Billy Mitchell sent one of his sent his officers out along the route, and they just would go, and they would go out with the mayor or some other town official, and they'd, they'd sort of scout the terrain and, and say, well, you know, well, Farmer Joe, you know, be, will he make his his field or pasture available for us? And and they negotiated deals on the spot, and uh, they marked it with limestone with a big circle and a and a numerical uh, identifier, so pilots would have an idea of where they were landing. Uh, and um, you know that they then of course they had to supply it with fuel uh, and spare parts each airfield and some sort of communications infrastructure so in that case maybe that meant running a telegraph line out or a telephone line out to the field from the town um now they the one thing they did that that made it doable was they chose as their route basically the path of the union pacific railroad uh, at least west of chicago and uh so this obviously made it much easier to supply these fields uh, with supplies because the, the fields were all located in towns situated on the railroad. In fact, they in many cases existed only because of the railroad. Um, and uh, uh, but I mean, even so, it was just it was a crazy improvised thing. I mean, literally one of the fields in Green River, Wyoming, uh, the, the 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 it snowed the, a day or two before the race and there was like a foot of snow on the on the field it hadn't been prepared at all and uh they had to skip it for the first few days just so the uh, air service officer assigned to the green river could you know round up tw uh, 20 horse teams and a bunch of local volunteers to clear the sagebrush once the snow had melted i mean it was that kind of thing yeah it's absolutely fascinating really my favorite yes. part of the book in some ways is the description of those airfields if you even want to call them that and develop development of that Many of them, though, live on today in some form, at least. I mean, some of the cities involved would be recognizable to any pilot flying across the country. So you can kind of see the mark from from this in many places even today. You can. Of course, they don't look anything like they did in 1919. I mean, there there are a few that can definitely trace their pedigree to the transcontinental race. One is a Britain field uh, in, in uh, Rochester, New York. That's now Rochester's International Airport, which is served by some major carriers. Another one in uh, uh, Quad Cities, uh, the Quad Cities at Rock Island, Illinois, which serves the Quad Cities area, of Illinois and Iowa, uh, and maybe one or two others. But for the most part, of course, you know, the, there's nothing left of the uh, uh, of the contest. It's interesting reading about air races and what an essential part of pop culture, even much beyond aviation, in those early days was. And I thought it was interesting, just a, a few weeks ago, the National Aeronautic Association announced it's going to host a four-day, thousand-mile air race for electric aircraft this time, sort of trying to recapture some of that sense of early aviation days. Why do you think those early air races were so important? And do you think an event like that can still work in the 21st century? Well, there's a lot more stuff competing for our attention now, obviously. Um, you know, this was no, nobody had a smartphone in 1919. Nobody was on TikTok. Um, and uh, uh, so I think in some ways the country was, you know, there, it was more, there was more sort of uh, 
the country could focus its collective attention uh, on things the way that it perhaps doesn't in a, in a much more fragmented age. So I, 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 I mean, I, I, I had not actually heard of the electric air race. And I, my first thought was that's going to be a long extension for it. But <laughs> um, uh, anyway, uh, uh, so I, and I, I mean, I, for one, will certainly pay attention to that. I find it fascinating that, that that's that's being attempted. Um, but uh, I mean, I, I, I think th- this this age has passed. I mean, I, for one thing, you know, aviation was still so new. I mean, it was in, in 1919, it was, that was only 16 years, uh, after the Wright brothers at Kitty Hawk, you know, I mean, I mean, this was a brand new technology. People really had no idea, uh, you know, uh, what, what, how it was going to evolve. I mean, they could speculate, but it was all, it was very much in its early stages. And so I think, you know, it was just, it had a novelty value that, that the airplane just lacks today, um, that pretty much anything lacks today. Um, and uh, so in that sense, I think it was kind of unique to the times. John, let's take a quick break. And when we come back, I want to ask you about flying the route. Earn your pilot's license. Get current or add a rating. No matter what your goal is, Sporty's pilot training app will save you time and money. It's available on all your devices, including iPad, iPhone, Android, and smart TVs, so you can access Sporty's award-winning courses anywhere. Plus, with automatic sync between platforms and free lifetime updates, you'll always be current. Over 25 courses are available, from private pilot to aerobatics. Visit sporties.com slash discover for a free trial. Now, back to pilot's discretion. We're back with John Lancaster, who not only wrote a book about this transcontinental air race, but he also flew it himself in a light sport aircraft, which sounds like a great way to research a book. Uh, So, John, what was what was most surprising about that or what did you learn on that trip that really opened your eyes? Well, I learned that my wife is exceedingly tolerant (laughs) because (laughs) I have to say when I when, when I first conceived this book, I thought, you know, if I really want to do it right, I ought to, you know, do it right. And that meant flying the route. But I, th- I thought this is going to be a tough sell at home. Uh, you know, so you can imagine the conversation with my wife when I explained that I had this great book idea. And, oh, by the way, I needed to buy an airplane and fly across the country and back, even though I hadn't flown in almost 40 years. I, I should mention I did get my pilot's license in 1980, but it obviously uh, had, had not seen any use since about 1981 or 82. Um and uh, so it took some retraining, um, but uh, I, it just seemed uh, uh, like um, uh, it would lend a it, it would add a dimension to the book that would otherwise be missing. I, I wanted to be able to describe, you know, what the Medicine Bow Mountains looked like, um, and uh, uh, you know what the sort of Utah Salt Flats looked like, and it just it just um, seemed like it's it seemed like it would give the book a dimension that. It wouldn't have if I just had relied on Google Earth or whatever. Um, uh, and uh, so it, it uh, and it was also really fun. I mean, I'll, I'll just be honest. I mean, it was it was the adventure of a lifetime. Um, I mean, I had and it was a challenge. I mean, I had at the time, I think if you count the maybe 100 hours I'd accumulated in the early 80s, and then I maybe added another 100 hours of, re, of flying, you know, before I actually attempted this flight. So I was a 200 hour pilot, you know, um, and, uh, uh, <laughs> needless to say, I, I was not instrument rated. And of course, LSAs aren't instrument certified anyway. Um, but, uh, you know, I, 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 you know, was feeling fairly confident. I'd taken some fairly long training flights, uh, including one to the Bahamas, uh, with someone who actually knew what he was doing and could show me how my avionics worked. Um, so, you know, by the time I took, took off, I had actually been flying quite a bit and I was fairly confident and, uh, it turned out to be really fun. Yeah. That's one of the all time spouse stories. I think we've all in aviation had to do various sales jobs over the years about why wow, we really need that new headset or maybe some new avionics, but that, that's a great one. I'm writing the book and I can't do it without buying an airplane. I'll remember that one. Yeah. Well, just to be clear, she saw through me instantly, um, you know, but she let me do it anyway. So I'm in her debt. <laughs> you obviously had a ton of tools uh, that the pilots of a hundred years ago did not. What do you think actually made the biggest difference? Is it 
reliable engine, data link weather, GPS, air traffic control? What what did you have that was most helpful that those pioneers didn't have? Gosh, well, it's, it's hard to say because it's obviously there's been such a revolution in technology and really just a revolution in the last 20 or so years with, with the digital uh, uh, revolution and the glass panel, which I, you know, I had a full glass panel on my LSA. Um, so, you know, there's, there's just so much. I mean, obviously, a reliable engine is a good starting point. You're not getting very far without one of those. But I would say the thing that I, I that that was just kind of took so much of the stress and guesswork out of out of this was the GPS. I mean, that that that, that single technology. I mean, just being able to sort of punch in the airport code and then you know follow the magenta line, and then of course then set the autopilot. I mean. You know, you don't want to say it's idiot proof because there's still plenty of ways to get in trouble, even in a modern air, airplane. Uh, and there are times you have to exercise your judgment. And, you know, of course, you actually have to, you know, enter the pattern and keep your eyes open and land the thing. So you still have to fly the plane. But um, I did feel a lot of the, a lot of the time that this is cheating. This is this is just cheating. <laughs> you know, it's just it's not fair. <laughs> you know, um, and the other thing that that I was that 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 struck me was just being in an enclosed cockpit, right. With a, with a noise canceling headset on. I mean, these guys were in open cockpits, uh, and these, these were unmuffled engines that DH4 had a 12 cylinder, you know, uh, 400 horsepower Liberty engine. I mean, just imagine, and these guys would literally be deaf for 20 minutes when they, when they got on the ground. Um, so, you know, there were, there were many times that I, you know, uh, gave thanks for the fact that, that, you know, I had a, I had a modern airplane. I feel like many pilots or at least some pilots are scared of such a long cross country flight. But in my experience, those long, long trips can be the most rewarding part of flying. As you mentioned, they can be somewhat stressful. There's some work, but I think they're life changing sometimes. So what's your advice for somebody who's maybe considering one of these long trips, especially in a, in an LSA or a small airplane? What's your advice for somebody thinking about a trip like that? Well, first of all, I'd say do it. You know, I, I mean, it was a great experience. And, and I, I think that, you know, it, it, you have to uh, basically think about it as not one long trip, but as a series of very small trips. You know, I, I mean, say, first of all, don't be in a hurry, <laughs> you know, give yourself an open ended s- uh, schedule. So if you get stuck in Rochester, New York by bad weather for two or three days, like I did, it's no big deal. Um, and, uh, you know, wait for good weather to cross you know, major mountain ranges for obvious reasons, uh, which I, I did that as well. Um, but you know, if you break it into bite-sized pieces, I mean, I I was actually, I was actually doing some research at some of these towns along the way. I'd stop in a local library or historical society or whatever. Sometimes there were newspapers that other, other materials that they had that were not available online. And, uh, uh, so, you know, I kind of had an excuse to spend a few days in each place, but I would say, you know, don't be in a hurry. And just think of it as a series of small flights. Like, you know, my first day, I, I flew from Roosevelt Field on the, well, excuse me, can't fly from Roosevelt Field since it's now a shopping mall, uh, but at Republic Airport uh, on Long Island to Binghamton, New York, which was the first stop in the race. Uh, and then I ended my day at the second stop in the race, which was Rochester, where I, where I had to do some research. I mean, that was, you know, what was that? Maybe three hours of flying total. I can't remember, but it wasn't like a terribly long day of flying. I don't think there were any days. Except when I, when I on, on the way back, I, I saw no point in kind of landing at some of the places I'd landed going out. So I did have some longer flying days on the way back. But for the most part, I never flew any more than three or four hours in a day. And of course, I would you know land every couple of hours regardless. Um, so again, if you think of it as sort of uh, you know a, a series of, of short flights, it seems much less daunting, and it's totally doable. And I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm sitting here to tell you that. <laughs> so. A few questions about your previous life as a foreign correspondent before we get to our ready to copy segment. First, I'm always curious about skills that translate from other parts of life to flying. So any skills that uh, you used as a foreign correspondent that are valuable as a pilot? Well, in some ways, I guess I hadn't ever really thought about that as an interesting question. Um, I mean, I, I think to be a successful foreign correspondent, you have to be I would say open to adventure, certainly. So I think that's applies to flying. Um, uh, you have to be, uh, uh, I think, sort of organized and focused. I mean, you, you know, you, you have to, if you're dropping into an unfamiliar city for the first time in South Asia or the Middle East, like I did 
you know, too many times to count. I mean, you have to be very organized about what, where you're going, what your objectives are. Um, so there's a lot of planning involved, there's a lot of prep work involved before you, before you even get on the plane to where you're going. So there's some parallels there, I would say. Um, uh, and, uh, you know, um, so I mean, I would I would say th the difference, of course, is that there's not really a technological aspect to being a foreign correspondent. I mean, certainly you have to master the basics of getting your stories back to Washington. In my case, I work for the Washington Post. But, uh, you know, it, in the age of the Internet, that's not very hard. There are some parallels. Mostly they're just both really fun. You're in New Delhi for one of your postings, I know. So what's something most Americans get wrong about India that you learned from your time there? Oh gosh, another interesting question that I hadn't thought about. Um, what most Americans get wrong about India? Well, I would say that you know this is actually a little dated. I, I got to India in in two thousand and two, uh, right? Uh, sort of, I wouldn't say at the dawn of the tech age, but fairly early in the technology age when the sort of whole outsourcing boom was just taking off. Those companies had been gestating for a while, but it really exploded. Uh, during my time there. And I, so I, I think most Americans now understand that India is actually a very a hub of technology uh, expertise and activity. At the time, that wasn't the case. I think a lot of people still had sort of an outdated view of India as this kind of antiquated, creaky, uh, not very efficient democracy, which is still true in a lot of ways. But there's also a very sort of 21st century side to the place. I think people are surprised by, um, especially if you go to one of the tech centers like Bangalore or, Ch or uh, Chennai or something like that. So I'd say that's probably the one that comes immediately to mind. Okay, John, we always close these podcast episodes with something we call ready to copy. I'll throw out some questions on a wide variety of topics and you give me your quick answer. Are you ready to copy? Ready to copy. Your book showed to me the essential role the military has played in aviation development. We think about World War II, but World War I uh, you quote how from 1917 to 1918, airplane production increased 18 fold and we trained 10,000 pilots. So is it an exaggeration to say that American aviation exists because of the military? Not really. Uh, n not really. I mean, certainly in terms of the the sort of government's involvement, that really started with the military. The government has invested, you know, billions over the last century in, in uh, you know, aeronautics and aircraft development and the technology that, that powers the industry. So, I mean, there have been other factors, too. There's now a sort of commercial uh, imperative that didn't exist in 1919. But certainly in the early days, you have to say that the military... Uh, was was the driving force between uh, between a lot of the uh, aviation development we saw in this country. Reading your book, there's lots of common themes with today, especially about weather and uh, get their itis. So, do you think aviation's continuing problem with VFR flight into IMC is somehow rooted in that early airmail pilots' mindset of deliver the mail no matter what the weather? Do you think that lives on today to some extent? I think it lives on today, but I think it's it, it, it's rooted more in just human nature. You know, I think people are just are, are impatient and they they talk themselves into doing things that uh, they probably you know know in, in some part of their mind that they shouldn't be attempting. I mean, we see it happen all the time, as you as you suggest. Um, and uh, so, in that sense, there's a lot about flying that hasn't changed because certainly a lot of the fatalities in the race were caused by pilots who were just a little bit impatient and perhaps a little bit overconfident. What's your favorite anecdote from the book? An incredible story or fact? I know I've got three or four, but I'm interested in if there's one that stands out to you. Well, as you say, there's several sort of like choosing among your children, but, but uh, uh, one that comes immediately to mind is Belvin Maynard, the uh, uh, Baptist uh, preacher turned air service lieutenant uh, who uh, uh, I don't want to give away any major plot points, but but he, he's a major figure in the race. And at one point, he was flying over Nebraska, and um, his engine, uh, the crankshaft broke, and he made a forced landing in a cornfield. Uh, and he and his mechanic thought they were out of the race, but um, then they got word that there was a that one of the other aircraft, also with the same kind of engine, had crashed. Uh, uh, just a few miles away. And so they got permission from headquarters to remove one of the engines. And under the race rules, they had to be on their way again within, I can't remember, it was 24 or 48 hours. It's in the book, but I've forgotten. But anyway, they had a very short period of time. They, as I believe it was just 24 hours, they had to uh, change, the, change out the engine overnight um, by the light of headlamps from farmers' trucks and, and a portable lighting system. So if you can imagine, they, they 
had to unship the engine from the crashed Martin bomber, uh, put it on a flatbed, drive it 40 miles, I believe, to this field where it was. And uh, the mechan- mechanic and, and a helper uh, managed to get this thing installed uh, between basically between sunset and sunrise, and they were on their way again the next morning. Yeah, that's an absolutely unbelievable story. That was on my list. The other one I liked was the pilot who got knocked unconscious because the ice from the radiator flew off and hit him in the head. So that's, to your point about an enclosed cockpit, not something we have to worry about today. Yes, yeah, for sure. Do you have a favorite airport you visited along the air race route or a favorite stop or site? That's an interesting question too. I just have to pause for a moment. Um, I mean, there were several. Oh, I do have a favorite. I do have a favorite. Sydney, Nebraska. Um, uh, it was uh, uh, a, a stop on the race. The, the last stop if you're heading west before Cheyenne, Wyoming, on the western edge of Nebraska. And uh, I mean, maybe maybe it's my favorite just because I, I remember the landing so vividly because it was it was right at the edge of my crosswind uh, capability. It was gusting up to like 24 knots at, you know, I don't know. And not quite 90 degrees off the runway, but it was a, a kind of a hairy landing. I actually had to go around uh, and then land again. And I just remember being so happy to be there. Uh, and then I, I landed. It was just, it was, it was outside of town on right on the prairie. Uh, it was one paved runway. And then I believe it had a grass strip running in another direction. Um, and I taxied, it was di- taxied with difficulty because it was so windy. Uh, and I taxied up to the ramp. And there was just no one around. Um, and I was kind of freaking out because like, where do I tie down my plane? Where do I get fuel? And I mean, it was just deserted. And then after about 10 minutes, this guy came out kind of embarrassed, um, who basically who was the local airport manager. And he'd been, he hadn't heard, I'd actually called the, the, uh, the, the phone number for the airport and he hadn't answered and he came out very apologetically. He'd been working on his plane in a hangar and hadn't heard it. And he just was the nicest guy and uh, let me keep my plane in the hangar overnight. Uh, I'm not even sure he charged me or if he did, it was almost nothing. Um, and we, we just had a, a great chat about my trip and, and aviation. And he, you know, he had a, a 172, I believe, that, that he was a fairly young guy. And uh, I just remember that very fondly as a, you know, a, a really hospitable airport manager in a part of the country that I had never been and knew nothing about. That's that great GA spirit. Love to hear those stories. This was your first book. So I'm curious what you think the biggest myth is about the book publishing business. Oh gosh, that's, that's a good one. What's the biggest myth? Um, (laughs) well, let's see. Um, I, I guess I can only look at it from the perspective of uh, oh, okay. That's an easy one, actually. Now that I think about it, and and again, this is just from I, I published one book, but this is my own perspective. There's a rap, the rap on the book industry these days is that books don't get edited, uh, and frankly, if you read a lot of books, you do see see a lot of errors in there, a lot of typos that, that I don't remember seeing twenty or thirty years ago, um, and uh, and I think it is true that the publishers, you know, they operate with thin publish m- profit margins and uh, uh, have pared back somewhat on their their editing uh, staff. Having said that. I had a great editor um, and uh, he was just really thoughtful guy. He improved the book in all kinds of ways without, you know, in in any way sort of changing its spirit or or structure or anything really that I was wedded to. Um, So I would say that at least in the case of my publisher, which was Liverite, which is part of W.W. Norton, which is a, a major publisher that people have probably heard of, uh, it, at least at live right, uh, public editing lives on. And, and, um, and, uh, you know, so in that sense, I would say it's a myth that, that books don't get edited anymore. Mine certainly was and edited well. You reported from Cairo for the Washington post for many years. So what's your favorite Middle Eastern food that all pilots need to try that we may not have heard of? Well, my mind immediately goes to Beirut because I, I, I went to Beirut at any, at the drop of a hat, didn't need any excuse to go to Beirut. I, I came up with all kinds of flimsy story ideas to get my, myself to Lebanon because as a friend of mine said, it's impossible to eat a bad meal in Lebanon. Um, and it's really true. But I guess if I had to pick one favorite food, I'd say just the shawarma they serve off the street in Beirut is just, it's as good as anything you'll get in a fancy restaurant in New York or Washington or anywhere else. Uh, that that sticks in my mind. Our last question is always the same. You have one final flight. We want to know what are you flying and where are you going? 
Well, I should say I am. Uh, I sold my plane last year, sadly, um, and uh, I miss it every day. So that's the only plan I ever wanted to own, or as a, at least in this phase of my life. And it's the only plan I'd, I'd ever want to own if I got another one. Um, it was perfect for my needs. Uh, I loved it. And uh, so I've got the exact same plane that I had. I might want to try flying back to the Bahamas this time by myself, uh, because I just remember that as a magical trip. You know, a little bit of excitement. You're flying over a couple hundred miles of open water in a single engine plane. That That's something that keeps your mind focused. Um, and it's also just breathtakingly beautiful to see those, you know, sand formations around the islands in the Bahamas and, and to come in over the, you know, sparkling waters to land at Eleuthera as I did. Um, and, uh, you know, I would, I would, I would take the same trip in the same plane. And I know that's not very imaginative, but that's my honest answer. John, thanks for being on the podcast. Great talking to you, John. Thanks for having me. Thanks for listening to Pilot's Discretion, brought to you by Sporties, training and equipping pilots worldwide for over 60 years. For more episodes and today's show links, visit sporties.com slash podcast. I'm John Zimmerman. We'll see you next time on Pilot's Discretion. Discretion.